Our scripture reading today comes to us from Romans chapter 6. I'll be reading Romans 6 verses 1 through 14. Here now, the word of Almighty God. As Paul writes to the church saying, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? We were therefore buried with Him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, that we too may live a new life. For we, if we have been united with Him in a death like His, we will certainly also be united with Him in a resurrection like His. For we know that our old self was crucified with Him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with Him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, He cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over Him. The death He died, He died to sin once for all. But the life He lives, He lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that they obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to Him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but under grace. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank You for the death You died for us. One that gives us forgiveness of our sins. One that gives us the hope of the glory of eternal life. But we know, Almighty God, that there is something that we must do in order to receive that gift, and that is to accept it. And so today, as we are reminded in Your Word of what it is that we need to do, we ask that You would help us to turn to You, to repent of our sins and to come with open hearts to receive Your gift, Your gift of love. A gift of love that we pray today that You will help us to return to You and to others so that they may come to know Your love through us. Bless us now as we dig once again into Your Word and learn how we can apply it in our lives. And as we ask this, Lord Jesus, in Your precious name. Amen. Shortly after World War II, the art of bonsai came to America. Now this was kind of strange since uh, during World War II, uh, America was at war with Japan. But shortly afterwards, many people were intrigued by the practices of those who participated in the art of bonsai. You see, bonsai trees are measured not in feet, but rather in inches because these beautiful little trees are not allowed to reach anywhere near their full growth potential. The reason for the bonsai tree in its stunted form is that when it first starts popping through the soil, its owners will take it, pull it out of the soil, cut off its main tap root, and then replant it into a smaller container. By doing this, its growth is deliberately stunted and its roots are limited in their ability to spread out and to grow deep enough to take in enough of the soil's nutrients 
for natural growth. What is done to the bonsai tree by its owner is what Satan tries to do to every believer if he can. He is going to try and cut us off from our root of connectedness to God. He wants us to have a limited ability and a limited access to receiving in life what God supplies for our spiritual growth. Satan's plan is to cut us off from that growth we can receive from God. Last week, whenever we were looking at that scriptural mandate we have to move forward in our faith, we talked about what it means to actually be a disciple of Jesus Christ and then to go and make disciples of Jesus Christ. We listened to that beautiful prayer that he lifted on our behalf, praying that we would be united, that we would come together in the love of God, and that we would do all these things as we moved forward as his followers. Today, we hear once again Paul telling the Roman church that part of being a follower of Jesus Christ is that we must do certain things. The main one that he talks about this morning is that we have to put that sinful behavior behind us if we are to continue in that movement forward. And I think he does so in such an interesting way because someone must have asked him about the grace part of the statement that we mentioned last week. Remember I said that we are justified by grace through faith. What that means is, is that we are made holy, justified through God's love, His grace, because of faith in Jesus Christ, because of what Christ did for us. Paul's response in our reading this morning shows us that we cannot stay in our sin. We cannot stay where we are. We have to keep moving forward and we have to get away from the sin that we have committed. We have to be different. Different if we are to show the world who Jesus is. Now, as I said, someone must have challenged Paul on the question of grace because he uses the love of God statement that we made last week to challenge the church in its thinking. He says this statement. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? The question Paul is answering has to be because someone asked him, okay, so let me get this straight. If we receive God's grace whenever we sin and seek forgiveness for our sin, does that mean that the more I sin, then the more grace I can get from God? I guess it, if, if we really think about it, it would be kind of like a parent who rewarded their kids with a milkshake every time they did something wrong and then came and told on themselves. then the kid might think that, well, every time I do something wrong, then I can get more milkshakes if I keep doing more wrong things, right? But that's not how this works. That's not how the grace of God works. Look at what Paul says in verse 2. He uses the term, by no means. Don't even think about it. That's not how this works. The meaning of this discussion is not about being able to receive some special gift for every bad thing we do. This is not positive reinforcement for the negative action. The real point of this is about the relationship we have in faith in Jesus Christ and how the love of God in us is turned around by our love for God and by keeping away from the things that we know we do wrong. This is nothing new to the church. In fact, we've dealt with this kind of thinking for a long time. When John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, was preaching in the open fields in the city streets of England, he knew that people would think this same way. That if they thought that salvation was only about the gift that we get when we do something wrong and then turn ourselves in, that we would think only about how we can continue to receive that special gift over and over and still be able to stay living in our sinful state. 
And so to help people understand that a relationship with Jesus Christ is all about love and not about getting something out of it, he came up with three simple rules to help people in their walk with God. To help people in their remembrance. To help people in that understanding of what it really means to love someone. He reminded people that Jesus said that the two most important commandments we have to follow or that we have to remember were that we were to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and that you were to love your neighbor as yourself. But He also helped people to see that the key word in those statements, in those commands from Jesus Himself was the word love. First, love of God and second, love of others. And so His three little rules centered around love so that Christians could live in that love and do all they could to show the world what that love is all about. So the three simple rules that he developed to help people were to first, do no harm. That sounds pretty simple, right? The second one was to do all the good you can. Again, sounds pretty easy. And then he also said, Attend to the ordinances of God. Which means that we need to continue to do the spiritual things that help us to stay committed and stay in love with God. It's all about loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself. We don't have time to cover all of these today, so we'll be taking the next couple of weeks to take a look at each one individually. So today, let's start with the first one. To do no harm. Going back to our scripture reading this morning, we understand that what Paul was trying to help the church understand is that when we do no harm, that we stop sinning. It means that we examine our lives in such a way as to expose any evil in our lives and then work on removing it. This is not easy for some people. Because as Christians, we don't like to think that there might be some evil way in our lives. We don't like to think that we might be doing some bad things. We like to think that we're basically good people and that we're not as bad as some and that we're definitely better than some others. We don't like things like Psalm 139, which challenges us. It's a prayer that was written to help us to ask God to search us and see if there's anything offensive in our lives and to ask His help in removing it. We don't like to have to acknowledge that we could be doing something wrong. We don't like to acknowledge that we might be saying something wrong. We don't like to have to admit that we're not perfect or that we really do need forgiveness from some sin. Because let's face it, wasn't that what Jesus gave us? When He died, didn't He automatically give us a free pass into heaven? No. Actually, yes and no. When Jesus died on the cross, He did it to provide a way for us to be forgiven of our sins and for us to enjoy His eternal kingdom. But no, we don't get an automatic pass. It doesn't automatically happen. We still have to do something. We still have to repent and ask God for it. Our salvation is based on our acceptance of God's love. It means we still have to come to Jesus and confess those sins every time we commit them. And we need to live in such a way that we don't do the things we know we shouldn't do. And that's why Paul is arguing about the grace of God. He's starting with the fact that God loves us. And he is stating that that grace is there for each, of, each one of us. But, he also says that we have to want it. And in wanting it, we have to realize that it's not a grace we should cheapen or take advantage of and continue to try living in some sin so that God can keep forgiving us and so that we can keep getting more of that grace. His argument, and Wesley's too for that matter, was that if we really understood grace as Christians, 
we would understand that grace is all about the love of God, that He loved us first, and as Jesus said, like a father loves his children. And if we really believe in Jesus Christ, we're going to live in such a way that shows our love for God and our love for our neighbors. We aren't going to keep doing anything evil, sinful, or bad because we know that that damages the relationship that we have with God and it damages the relationship that we have with others. Yes, every time we sin and turn back to God, His grace and His love are there for us. Every time. No matter what we do. But that does not mean that we can continue to live any way we want and still call ourselves God's followers. No. If we really are His followers, if we really are His children, we will do no harm. We will not sin. We will look deep into our lives and realize the connection we have with God and others, and we will look for ways to honor those relationships, not damage them. As followers of Jesus Christ, we have to ask ourselves in every situation, is this the way Christians are supposed to live? We must do the self-examination no matter how hard it is. And no matter what we might uncover in our own lives, so that we might be able to see where we are damaging our relationship with God. Where we're missing something. We have to look for better ways to practice our faith so that others can see our commitment to God. We have to look at what harm we might have caused someone else. And we have to settle those disputes so that others can come to know Jesus Christ because of us. How often have you heard Christians bad-mouthing each other and doing so out in public so that someone might think, well, hey, man, if that's what that church is like, I don't want anything to do with it. It happens all the time. And as God's followers, we've got to do better. We have to seriously look at what Wesley said when he said that we must do no harm. Because like Paul, his message is one that helps us to actually draw closer to God as we ask that question and closer to one another. To live in that love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as your self-command that Jesus gave us. Last week we looked at Jesus' prayer for us. A prayer that we would be one. A prayer that we would be one with God prayer that we would be one with each other. A prayer that Jesus Christ prayed for you and for me. Because in that prayer, He was pointing back to loving God and loving our neighbor. He was pointing back to His own teachings and His own hope that we would do everything in our power to live life doing no harm. As Christians, we believe it is possible to live life in a way that shows the love we practice. One that does no harm. One that recognizes evil and one that wants to remove it from our lives. When we do no harm, it means we do no harm to ourselves. It means we do no harm in our relationship with God. And it means that we do no harm to fellow Christians. And we do no harm to those who don't know Jesus so that everyone can see Christ living in us. I asked a question on Wednesday night at Recharger about taking this seriously and looking at what image of Jesus Christ we are showing to the world. If Jesus Christ called us to be His people in such a way that others can see Him living in us, what exactly are we showing the world that Jesus looks like by our actions and our words? If we're doing wrong, if we're saying wrong, if there's something we can't let go of or some sin that we are just holding on too tightly to, if there is some evil we cannot give up, what message is it that we are sending to other people that we are trying to get to join us? 
As Christians, we've got to guard our hearts, we've got to guard our thoughts, and we've got to guard every part of our lives so that our language, our actions, and indeed everything we say and do shows the love of God and the grace of God in action in our lives. Paul said it. We're dead to sin. We are dead to sin because of what Christ did for us. But in the same way, he also said, count yourselves alive to God in Christ Jesus. Because Christ is alive and Christ is alive in us. My friends, we do have to remember that Christ died for us. But He is also alive for us. For us to know the love of God and to share that love with others. But that means that we can't take it for granted and we can't keep doing the stuff we know we shouldn't be doing. Paul would go on to tell the Roman church that we must know these things. That our love must be sincere. That we must hate what is evil and we must cling to to what is good. We must not let Satan cut us off from God, from the spiritual growth that we know that we need in order to move forward as followers of Jesus Christ. And we must take this first rule of Wesley seriously and look for all the ways, all the ways we can do no harm. To remove any obstacles in our lives that might keep us from the love of God. It's a good time to talk about this because this week we start the season of Lent. A season of preparation, a season of soul searching that is supposed to get us ready in our, in our walk with God to draw closer to Him as we make preparations for the Easter season. Well, as I mentioned earlier on Wednesday this week, we're going to have a special Ash Wednesday worship service here and I invite you to come. I ask you to seriously commit to being here as we begin this time of preparation together, as we walk together towards Easter and the celebration of what Jesus Christ did for us. To start this Wednesday with a heart-searching and a soul-searching opportunity to look for ways to get rid of those things that keep holding us back, the things that we keep holding on to and that are indeed still doing harm in our lives. You see, God's desire is for all His children, for all of us, to be able to share the love of Jesus Christ and to share the image of Christ. And as I said last Wednesday, we've got to start looking at what we show the world that Jesus really looks like. And we've got to start doing better. And the first way we do that is by doing no harm. Amen? Let's pray.